So before science was hijacked, there were always studies about where did these people live? Where did they migrate to? What did they eat? Why did they die out? And um, it was proper studies that were not funded by big pharma or big food. They actually wanted to know the answer to the questions, which is severely lacking in the last, I would possibly say, definitely in the last decade, maybe longer. But anyway, so stable isotope testing is a very powerful tool. The researchers use it because it can show you not just what they ate, but all their habits and where they migrated to, what happened when they were kids to when they were adults, those sort of things. And there are different parts of the body that can tell you different stories as well. But I want to just tell you what isotopes actually are. That's the first thing. They're different forms of the same element, and they have varying numbers of neutrons, resulting in slight difference in their atomic mass. So I've got a nice picture actually here. And carbon-12, carbon-13, carbon-14, I'll pick that deliberately because I think some people might have heard of carbon-12 dating and all this, but we'll talk about that. And what that shows you there is six protons, so six neutrons. That's why it's called carbon-12. And carbon-13 has an extra neutron, so it's called carbon-13. I know the screen is very small. It's so small, these atoms are actual size. And uh, carbon-14 there, two extra neutrons. Well, big deal, so what? Well, they're heavier and they're bigger, and it makes a big difference. And obviously, it's not just one of them. So when um, these are in the atmosphere or they're in the food you eat, it will make a big, big difference. So... Why do we use stable isotopes? Well, there's a clue in the name, stable. They don't decay over time, which makes them very useful for studying the past. So carbon-12 and carbon-13 are used for plants, and nitrogen-14 and 15 are used for animals. I'm going to link this back to blood, you see. A blood urea nitrogen test is looking at your protein metabolism because the breakdown of protein is nitrogen. So why is it called stable isotope testing? Well, the, there are things called unstable isotopes, and they decay over time, and that's why they're good for dating information. When I say dating, I don't mean who is the best person to go out with that evening. I mean, when did this thing happen? What was the decade? What was the century? What was the m millennia from this uh, particular study? And we call that radioactive, or you know, it decays basically over time. So we can look at the level of decay and work out, yeah, that is uh, 2,000 years old, 12,000 years old. Of course, stable isotopes don't do that. So once you eat something, it's absorbed into your tissue and you die and you get covered by sediment and buried and buried and then dug up, you know, three million years later, that's all still going to be there. So, so it's been a long day, right? So the researchers analyze the ratios of the stable isotopes in the humans, particularly in the teeth and the long bones, to determine the types of foods that were consumed by those individuals. And we just talk on why teeth is important because teeth continually continuously grow. All right, so you get the diet of the person from when they were born to to when they lose that tooth. Actually, not when they die, obviously. But most people in the past did have actually their full set of thirty-two teeth. Long bones continually break down, and reform. So we're going to talk about osteoclast, osteoblast later. So you get an approximation from long bones and collagen of the long bones in particular of the last 10 years of that person's life. So straight away, we've got a really scientific method of saying, from this tooth that's in this skeleton, we can work out that they ate fish when they started, and actually, by the third decade of their life, they didn't eat any fish, and they were eating mainly land animals. There you go, straight away. Well, you've got some migratory information about someone from millions of years ago that you can get from this brilliant science which uh, is going to annoy you in a minute because it's been completely hijacked and uh, lied about. But anyway, this is what we know. So it's really simple. Uh, by the way, this is going to be online. Um, if you want slides, my cards at the back, just email me and have these and uh, really get it into your head. So it's very easy to tell people that this is the way, this is the proper human diet. Low carbon, low nitrogen just means the person was plant-based with maybe some animal foods. We can't be categoric about that, but we can be very close to the percentages. High carbon, high nitrogen, seafood predominantly, in between its land animals. So it's really easy to to um, separate what we're doing. I, I don't want to get too technical, because it is Sunday night, and uh, you've been sitting very patiently. So then you get into some flash terms, like the trophic level. That just means where something falls in the food chain. So 
you know, we're apex predators, um, and that's where we are. That's our trof trophic level. And each loop in the level shows a different ratio between the carbon, uh, sorry, the nitrogen 15 and 14. You know, nitrogen 15 accumulates in tissues of the higher up animals, the ones that don't get predated on. So individuals who consume more animal protein, such as meat and fish, will have a higher nitrogen 15 level compared to those who relied on a plant-based diet. And I'm reading these out because I sat in the back and I couldn't see the screen really, and I, I spent yesterday rewriting some of these, so uh, they were a bit bigger. And that's it. You compare the ratio, ice, uh, the isotope ratios in teeth and bones, and then you get all these insights. For example, if an individual's teeth show a high proportion of marine resources compared to the bones, it suggests that they consume more seafood during their childhood than in the adult years. So, as I say, you look at that tooth, and you get some other, other signs as well. So you have this outer layer of enamel, and the underlying dentine layer contains not just collagen, but the mineral component as well. So we get some really good information from the mineral hydroxyapatite, which reflects fats, carbs, and proteins as well. So we can really really be pretty categoric about what people were eating. We can also be very categoric about the difference between marine and terrestrial food. There's only one source of carbon in a terrestrial system, and that's um, carbon dioxide. So carbon 13 to carbon 12 ratio works. In aquatic systems, there's other sorts of carbon, mainly one being dissolved carbonate. And I think Ben, this one says you can eat rocks. So uh, yeah, the PHC, you know, if anyone went there, that was like eating rocks. Now, uh, studies, particularly those focusing on early human foods or human diets during the Paleolithic period, suggest that animal foods may have made up a much larger proportion of the diet than previously thought. I took that exactly from ChatGPT, and we're going to talk about Google, ChatGPT, and if you do your own research. Because I didn't think that there was a large proportion of plants in diets or people in the past because I've done actual research. Uh, and like I say, so the tooth enamel and all those sort of things, I don't want to get too much into repeating stuff. And also we can see seasonal variations, believe it or not. So this is the chart, right? And then we're going to get into the kicker about how I was lied to. It's really this simple. So once they've analysed uh, the bones and they've looked at the stapel, stable isotope tests and they've looked at the teeth you can fit into this graph so the bottom left hand corner if you've got um, low carbon low nitrogen it's plant based it's simple as that if it's high carbon high nitrogen it's marine and in the middle it's animal it's really so simple okay so we know scientifically that humans ate mostly the fat and flesh of animals for over 2 million years at least and I'll put in there, just don't ask Google or even ChatGPT. And the reason for that is because if you ask Google or ChatGPT, they will ignore the science. And um, you can interrogate ChatGPT. Uh, I haven't got all the screenshots, but basically I went through this process and asked them what was, uh, what was our ancestral diet. And they said it was about 80% plants, pretty much across the board, all uh, continents, all periods of time. And I typed in, really? Because <laughs> you can actually have a conversation with Jack G. Peter or if you like an imaginary one. So really? Because that's not my research. My research says the exact opposite. And I guarantee the next answer was exactly what they wrote. Oops. My apologies. I have got that the wrong way round. <laughs> This is Chat GPT and said, uh, you were right, especially in the Paleolithic period, it was 80% animal, 20% plants. Now, the average person would not do that. Um, I hope we we're all not average people. So I'm just saying to you, if your friends say, no, we definitely ate a lot of plants, say to them, well, where do you get that information from? And uh, can I have the studies? Because they won't be able to do that. And they'll only be able to say, well, I looked it up on uh, Google or wherever. So. That's my little bit about stable isotope testing. So are you excited? Oh, I'm a you, are you excited? <laughs> right, you've got some ammunition, all right? Um, 